we will continue somehow on the same line of the talk that we saw on the video. So we will talk about somehow attention and attention derived from the perception that we have uh, of the reality that is surrounding us. And in particular, we, we perceive the reality around us uh, from our five senses, which includes also uh, vision and, and, and hearing, so sound and images. And the perception of sound and the perception of vision are pretty different one from each other. Uh, for instance, in this table I just listed uh, some of the differences between uh, hearing and, and seeing things. Uh, one of the main differences is that we can see objects that we, we can hear, objects generating sound that we don't see because the sound, let's say, uh, travel around the corner. Instead, if we want to see something, the object, the object has to be actually in front of us. It has to be within our range of vision. We can actually hear things that are beyond us. Uh, if I turn facing the screen and if I remove the microphone, you can still hear me talking, even if you don't see my mouth, my mouth uh, moving. There's many other uh, differences. For instance, whenever we hear a sound of an object, we have a rough idea about what the object is. But uh, when we see the object itself, we have a much more definite uh, description about what the object is. For instance, if you hear a sound, OK, so this is a car, but when you see the car, you can see this is a specific car. This is a Volkswagen Golf, for, for instance. And um, something that is also very different between uh, the sense of hearing and seeing is that you can close your eyes, but you can't close your ears. And um, you start hearing sound from the moment in which you're born till the moment in which you die. And usually sound and the sense of hearing, uh, it allows stacking of sound. You can actually hear multiple things at the same time, uh, while for vision this is not possible because once your vision is obstructed, you cannot see what's behind. So let's see what kind of information we get from the sound. The sound gives us clues about what the object is, the physical properties of the object, uh, what the object is doing, and where the object is located. Let's, let's try with, with few examples. Even if I don't see anything right now, I can somehow tell that this is an object hitting another object, it, and it's likely to be a metal object hitting another metal object. Another example of hitting, but in this case it's wood. Yeah, that's a coin falling on a table. Probably is a metal coin falling on a wooden table. I can't really tell you whether it's a one dirham or one US dollar, but actually it's a coin. Water in this case. And we can actually say something about the environment because since the sound is pretty reverberant, it's probably water dripping into, into a cave, into a sort of like empty and large space. So there's a lot of information that we can derive from, from audio. But let's see what we can hear, where we can hear it, and when. Uh, from the beginning of the human history, so from the moment when the Homo sapiens sapiens appeared on this planet, 200,000 years ago, till 150 years ago, all we could hear were natural sound, acoustically generated, so mechanically generated, uh, or sound of other over, over living creatures, some animals or other human beings. And in order to hear this sound, we need to be at the same place, at the same time in which the source generates the sound as well. Uh, 43,000 years ago, uh, humans somehow invented musical instruments, but things didn't really change much because those were still uh, acoustic devices that need mechanical energy in order to generate sound. And in order to hear the sound generated by an acoustic musical instrument, we need to be at the same, play, same place, at the same time, in which the musician is playing the instrument. What happened 150 years ago? Sound recording was introduced. Sound synthesis was introduced. So actually, we broke all the certainties that we had before. Sound could be moved away in space, in, uh, in, term of, uh, in, space, in time, and in terms of causality. So nowadays, when you hear something, you question yourself whether uh, it's something real or not. If you hear someone screaming, the first question is, uh, is the TV of my neighbor or is someone that is really in trouble in front of us? And this one was not the case uh, in the majority of the history of, 
of humanity. So let's see some of the interesting invention uh, during the last 150 years. And in particular, I want to stress uh, the, the phonograph introduced by Thomas Edison in 1877 that was the first device able to record and play back sound. That's how it looked like. Metal cylinder, there is a diaphragm that captured the sound that goes through the horn. There is a needle attached to the diaphragm. Hello, and hello, hello. You write a groove Mary had on a metal a lamb. cylinder. His face was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Ha, ha. Ha! And that's it. It's a purely mechanical device, but was the first device that allowed to record and play back sound. Many people at that time did, did not believe it, say, this is a trick, this is a joke, uh, this is a hoax. It's not possible to record and play back sound. It, it's a pretty awful uh, sound quality, but actually uh, at that time it was pretty surprisingly. It was possible to, to record sound. Um, Edison uh, introduced this device for very pra practical reason, recording voice and playing back voice. But pretty soon this one was used for entertainment. So they start to sell these cylinders in which uh, they recorded music. It was the first time in which music uh, was was possible to dislocate physically and um, physically music. So you don't need to be uh, inside a concert hall to listen to music, but you can listen to music at your place. And many other introduction uh, in the early 20th century, uh, sound synthesis, mechanical sound synthesis, electronic sound synthesis, uh, tape recorder, and so on. So this one gave the rise to, to, to the electronic sonic car. So using technology to make sound and to make music. Uh, and this one was also um, beneficial by the introduction of a variety of different synthesis techniques. So somehow this one, it expanded uh, the sound palette. Nowadays we hear sound that are real and sound that are completely synthetic and we are used to it. But when these sounds were introduced, people were not ready for it and these new sounds were not really uh, accepted. So as Waze claim, uh, the technological and socio-cultural socio changes that happened in the last hundred years has brought music to the point where every sound is admissible, theoretical, realizable, and equally accessible. So using technology today, we can uh, synthesize and we can realize any possible sound. And we can actually uh, dislocate sound in time, in space, and in causality. We can hear sound that were recorded days ago or years ago in other place, and the causality link is broken. So when you hear sound coming out from a loudspeaker, there may be a speaker in front of you or there may be nothing. It can be recorded on a tape or into a computer. So the causality does not have to be there. Even in this case, you're hearing my voice coming out from the speaker, but hearing, I'm here in front of you. So there is a physical dislocation between what you perceive with your ear and what you see in front of you. And actually, uh, in human perception, there needs to be a, a consistency, a coherence between what we see and what we hear. Otherwise, we are eluded. And with technology nowadays, we play around with this paradigm. We can actually um, intentionally create mismatching audio and video or matching audio or video. So we can use audio to create illusion or we can use audio to reinforce visual illusion. Let's see an, an example of a very typical um, auditory illusion, the McGurk effect. Pa, 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 pa. You hear pa, or maybe pa, so the letter is P or B. But look at this other clip. Pa, 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 pa. The audio didn't change, the visual changed. And in this case, you hear probably F, A, fa. Now, let's look at the two clips together and try to switch your attention left to right. Pa, 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 pa. So in this case, the perception of speech, it's really uh, somehow uh, affected by what we see. So we can somehow hear uh, the, the vision. We can actually um, try to, to decode the speech from the movement of the lips as well. And this one happen all the time. Also with uh, timbre of the sound, especially if you are familiar with a specific object. 
On the right, uh, we have a viola. And what do you expect to hear from a viola? Probably most of you are familiar with this, this musical instrument, and it has a specific timbre, a sound signature uh, that um, identify this object. But this is not clear, uh, this is not any more uniquely uh, specified for loudspeakers. What sound do you expect to hear from loudspeaker? It can be anything. It depends what I plug uh, to, my, to my loudspeaker. So we can actually say that loudspeakers has a very neutral timbre because I don't know what's going to come here from it. And same for musical instrument, acoustic versus digital or electronic musical instrument. Uh, what do you expect to hear from, from the first instrument, from the one on the right? It's an acoustic guitar. So probably this is what we expect to hear. But from the one on the right, anything can come out, honestly. It can be a synthetic bass, like this. And nowadays you're not shocked about hearing this because you're used to this kind of synthetic sound, but imagine when sound synthesis was introduced were pretty new sound. No one ever heard something like this, or also this. I can synthesize the sound of a piano with a, with a, a sound synthesizer. And we can also make a little experiment right here. This is not a digital musical instrument. It's not an electronic instrument. I won't even call it musical instrument, but what's the sound that's gonna come out from here? This is a resonator, cylindric resonator made of paper. There is a diaphragm, and there's a metal spring attached to it. But since you never saw this device, this object, you don't know what to expect. So if I shake it, it rumbles. If I shake it again, you know what's going to happen. It's going to rumble again. But when it comes to electronic or digital musical instruments, so let's say that this one is a similar device, if it still work, if I shake it, some sound is gonna come out, but I can change the mapping. And the sound that comes out now is completely different. So, Okay, the point is that we play around with this breaking the causality link between an action and the sonic reaction uh, with electronic musical instrument or digital musical instrument because one of their main characteristics is that the musical interface and the sound generating parts are physically separated, they're completely independent and can be designed uh, arbitrarily. So nowadays there are a lot of exotic musical interfaces that are features in many, uh, let's say, um, electronic music context in which part of the show, part of the uh, entertainment is also to try to realize what is the causality link between what you see, what is the performer doing, what is the performer, the performer doing, and what's the sound that is coming out from the speakers. Let's see a few examples of these uh, exotic or novel interfaces. Probably the most famous is the theremin from left theremin, long theremin, introduced in the 20s. Even if you don't really understand what is the technology behind there, after a while, you realize what is the causal link between what you hear and what you see. The hands. silent drum. This is something that physically is not possible, but after a while your brain gets used to it and you establish a causal link between this somehow illusion and voice control. So in 
this case, we're actually fooling your brain that a specific motor action is generating a sound. But actually, there is something in the between. There is like a lot of technology. There are sensors, and there is sound synthesis and so sound generating engine in the middle. And, or we can use also sound processing to, to generate somehow illusion of space. So One, this is a dry speech. Two, three, four. And without going into a specific room, I can use a digital signal processing technique One, two, to generate three, four, the feeling, the illusion that the person is speaking into a large and empty hall One, two, three, inside four, a metal tank, or the speaker One, is moving left two, to right. Three, four, communication One, channels, two, speaking over three, the phone, four, or stretching and compressing One, the time. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So it is possible to create illusion about time and space just using uh, computing techniques, sound and music computing techniques, signal, signal processing techniques. And sound is also used to, to reinforce the feeling of reality in specific contexts. So uh, for virtual reality, you can see from these experiments that uh, creating sound consistent with the virtual reality uh, increase the level of fidelity of a specific environment. So generating sound related to the step consistent with the environment in which the user is walking. Sensor connected to the shoes and generating sound consistent with the environment. Forest, snow, And sound can also be used to, to enhance or to uh, slightly modify the perception, the perception of taste. Uh, work from Charles Spence about digital flavoring. So using uh, sound to make food sweeter or more uh, bitter or making a chip crisper uh, just by using sound. So fooling your brain using sound. And sound is also used for making things fun, so convincing people to, for instance, take the stairs instead of taking the travel later, if the stairs make sound. This is an installation in Sweden. And as soon as the star makes sound, people start to take stairs, but it's a little bit more healthy than taking the travel later. So this is called the fun effect convincing people to do something just by making the specific action fun. Or the world deepest bin. They managed to collect double the rubbish they collect in a single day just by installing a very simple sonic interactive system. They give you the feeling that when you throw something in the bin, the depth of the bin is very, is very high. people started to be amazed by this system and started to pick rubbish from the floor, from the ground, and putting it inside just because they want to have fun. And yeah, and that's it. And this one actually, I think the fun effect, it also apply to this context, to this field in which I'm doing research. I think doing research with sound and music computing uh, and sound generically, it, it's somehow uh, fun. Uh, I do this because actually I enjoy doing this uh, and working in this field. So, the fun effect, it also applies to, to the specific field in which I'm working. I mean, you're motivated doing like hard and boring research work because you're motivated by um, some fun application that you will have uh, at the end of your work. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>